Constituent tests. In this video, we're going to be looking at phrase structures, that is to say, the structures of phrases and sentences. And whenever we're looking at a phrase structure like that, we should understand it as being a hypothesis. We're making a hypothesis as to how we think that linguistic expression is structured. And as a hypothesis, we should be able to test it. So that's what our constituent tests are all about, is testing hypotheses about phrase structure. So the first thing we need to understand is what a constituent is. Constituents are the parts of a sentence grouped under a node. So notice that we've got these lexical categories, which means that anything under those categories are constituents. So, for example, drew, a, uh, rose, on, his, friend. Those are all considered constituents. And then we can go higher and look at our NPs, like a rose and his friend, and those phrases are also considered constituents. Going a bit higher, we get the VP and the PP, so that would be on his friend or drew a rose. And then finally, we get to the very top of this phrase structure and we get drew a rose on his friend. That also is considered a constituent. So again, the question though is how do we know whether a phrase structure tree captures the real constituents? So linguists have come up with some tests to demonstrate whether a phrase structure is the right one or not. The first is the pro form substitution test. Then we have a deletion test, movement test, it cleft test, answer to questions test, and conjunction test. We'll go through each in turn. Our first test is the pro form substitution test. Now, you've probably heard the term pronoun. For linguists, that's a misnomer. A pronoun is actually a pro NP. It stands in for a noun phrase. So for example, if we take the sentence, the man drew a rose on his friend, we can substitute in pronouns for each one of those noun phrases. So the first one, the man, we can put he in that position. The second noun phrase, a rose, we can put in it. And the third noun phrase, his friend, we can put in her. So then you get he drew it on her. The fact that they've got that substitutability with pronouns suggests that those are, in fact, constituents. We can also get proforms for preposition phrases, pro-PPs. So, for example, there and then can substitute for locative and temporal PPs. So if we've got our sentence, the man drew a rose on his friend at midnight, we can substitute on his friend with there and at midnight with then. We can also get pro-VPs. The word do, do, sorry, do, stands in for a verb phrase. So for example, again, starting with the sentence, the man drew a rose on his friend, we can add another sentence there, and the woman did too, where that did is standing in for the verb phrase, drew a rose on his friend. So in that way, we can show that this whole string of words there, drew a rose on his friend, is in fact a phrase, namely a verb phrase. Our next test is deletion. The idea being here that we can leave out phrases when their meaning is understood from a previous sentence. So if we can leave it out, then it's a phrase, meaning it's a constituent. So again, we begin with our sentence, the man will, the man will draw a rose on his friend. And then we add the sentence, and the woman will too. And those ellipses right here suggest draw a rose on his friend, right? So that's what's understood there. The man will draw a rose on his friend and the woman will too, meaning the woman will draw a rose on his friend. We could also get instead of, and the woman will too, we can say, and the woman will on her enemy. Now in this case, it's not draw a rose on, on his friend that's being elided. Instead, it's just draw a rose. 
So the man will draw a rose on his friend and the woman will on her enemy, meaning and the woman will draw a rose on her enemy. All right, so those ellipses, that's another good test, deletion. Movement test is another one. The idea here is that constituents can be moved for grammatical focus or stylistic purposes, but the entire constituent moves together and it has to be a phrase level category. It can't just be a lexical category. So for example, if we begin again with our sentence, the man drew a rose on his friend, we can move on his friend to the beginning of the sentence. On his friend, the man drew a rose. We could also move a, a rose up to the beginning of the sentence. A rose, the man drew on his friend. Now that one sounds a little odd perhaps, but in the right context, I think you can get it. I'm gonna let you sort of try to figure out a context that would make sense of that sentence. What doesn't sound good, I think in any context is friend. The man drew a rose on his. And it's not that friend isn't a constituent, it's that it's not a phrase level constituent. It's not a noun phrase, it's just a noun. Another thing that we find, though, is that you can't move something that's not a constituent. So a rose on his friend, the man drew. That does make sense if he drew a picture of a rose on his friend. But if it's understood that where he drew the rose was on his friend, that is, he tattooed her, then it doesn't make sense. That itself is not a constituent because a rose is acting as the object of drew, and on his friend is then a preposition phrase that modifies that verb phrase, drew a rose. So that's the idea here, is that we've, we're positing a particular phrase structure, um, and we need to keep in mind what we're targeting here and what the conception of it is. It cleft is another one, and these are sort of an odd phenomenon that we've got in English, where we're able to topicalize certain parts of a sentence. That is, we can move them up to the beginning of a sentence to make them sort of the focus of the sentence in a sense. Okay, the general form for it clefts is it was X that Y, where we move something out of the main sentence, we put in that X position, and then the rest of it is the sentence as it was before. So we begin with the sentence, the man drew a rose on his friend. And then we can say something like, it was on his friend that the man drew a rose. I think that sounds pretty good. And notice again, it's very formulaic. It was X that Y. Uh, we could also topicalize a rose. So we can say, it was a rose that the man drew on his friend. That again suggests that a rose is acting as a constituent in that original sentence. But again, we can't just move a lexical category. So we can't say it was friend that the man drew a rose on his. That sounds ridiculous. Um, notice that we also can't move that whole thing. It was a rose on his friend that the man drew. We could get it again in that conceptualization that he drew a picture and the picture was of a rose on his friend. But if we're understanding it in the tattooed, uh, in the in the tattooed interpretation of the sentence, then it doesn't make sense. All right. Then our next one. It was the man that drew a rose on his friend. So we can also topicalize that first noun phrase, the man. And then finally, we see that the verb phrase drew a rose on his friend. Although that is a constituent, it cannot be topicalized. We can't topicalize verb phrases. It was Drew Rose on his friend that the man. That sounds terrible, but that's a false negative. Um, in other words, these tests, none of the tests are perfect. They need to be used in conjunction with each other. So one test is never sufficient. We want to do a battery of tests until we are able to come to a consensus that this is or is not a constituent. Our next test, answer to questions test. This is a good one where we're going to ask um, who, what, where, when, why type questions to see if we can isolate as an answer one part of the original sentence. And again, the idea is that if it can stand alone, then it's got to be a constituent.
So we start again with our sentence, the man drew a rose on his friend, and we ask the question, what did the man draw on his friend? A rose. Who did the man draw a rose on? His friend. Where did the man draw a rose? On his friend. What did the man do? Drew a rose on his friend. Who drew a rose on his friend? The man. What did the man do on his friend? Drew a rose. What did the man draw? A rose on his friend. Again, that only works, that last one, number eight, only works if he drew a picture of a rose on his friend, not if he was tattooing his friend. Then we've got the conjunction test. Uh, this is the idea that conjunctions, the way they work is they combine constituents of the same category together. And so we can get things like the man and the woman drew a rose on his friend. The man drew a rose on his friend and blew a kiss to his enemy. So the first one, we combine two noun phrases. The second one, we combine two verb phrases. We can also combine two preposition phrases. The man drew a rose on his friend and on his enemy. And then we can also combine verb phrases. The man drew a rose and drew a skull on his friend. That last one is pretty good evidence that this is in fact, uh, that that drew a rose is a verb phrase. In other words, it's a constituent with on his friend acting as a modifier of drew a rose. Now we're going to use these tests to look at some actual examples and see whether the bracketed words form a constituent or not. So we've got five sentences. The farmer looked up the zip code online. The farmer looked up the chimney. The farmer thought that the gangster was vicious. The farmer noticed the gangster. The farmer should be afraid. So I think all of these are fairly normal sentences, but what we're interested in is whether those bracketed series of words forms a phrase, forms a constituent or not. So we'll start with the farmer looked up the zip code online. So we'll try the isolation, the question test. Where did the farmer look online? Up the zip code. That sounds weird, doesn't it? Where did the farmer look online? Up the zip code. Yeah. Then I, I use this pound symbol to mean that it's not ungrammatical. It's that in context, it doesn't make sense. So in the context of um, this sentence, the farmer looked up the zip code online, it wouldn't make sense to say the farmer looked there. That is to mean up the zip code online. So the farmer looked there online and you want the there to stand in for up the zip code? No. Uh, it also seems ungrammatical to say it was up the zip code that the farmer looked online. We can't move that preposition phrase into that it cleft position. And then the last one, the conjunction test, the farmer looked up the zip code and down her nose online. Again, no. So in that case, I think we can all agree that up the zip code in this sentence is not a constituent. So let's look at a similar preposition phrase, the farmer looked up the chimney. We'll do the question test. The farmer looked where? Up the chimney. That sounds pretty good. How about the it cleft? It was up the chimney that the farmer looked. Yeah. Um, how about, and her husband looked there too, meaning her husband looked up the chimney too. Sounds good to me. The farmer looked up the chimney and down the well. Yeah. So in that case, I think we can comfortably say up the chimney is forming a constituent in this sentence. Next one, the farmer thought that the gangster was vicious. We can do a pro form substitution. Her husband thought so too. So the so stands in for a subordinate clause. Her husband thought that the gangster was vicious too. The so just stands in for that phrase that we've got bracketed. Question, the farmer thought what? That the gangster was vicious. It sounds pretty good as an answer. It was that the gangster was vicious that the farmer thought. Eh, it's a little odd, but yeah, I'll accept it. Uh, the farmer thought that the gangster was vicious and that the cop was malicious. Yeah, I like that one. So I think, again, the consensus from our tests seems to be that that, that the gangster was vicious is forming a phrase. The only one that I thought was iffy at all was the it cleft one. 
And, um, you know, it clefts are odd to begin with. Um, they seem to need a very specific context to license them in the first place. All right, number four, the farmer noticed the gangster. Uh, this one, I can't even figure out a question to ask that would try to isolate the farmer noticed. Um, something like, what the gangster? The farmer noticed. Yeah, that's awful. Um, it was the farmer noticed that the gangster, so doing an it clef, that's awful, right? Compare that to the earlier one that was a little odd. It was the gangster that was, it, it was that the gangster was vicious that the farmer thought versus this one, it was the farmer noticed that the gangster. That one's awful. The previous one was odd and stilted and weird, but not nearly as awful as it is in this one. The last one that we're gonna try is the conjunction test. The farmer noticed and the cop arrested the gangster. Now, that actually sounds fairly good to me. However, notice the pauses. This is not normal conjunction. The farmer noticed and the cop arrested the gangster. I can't say that in one fluid go. The farmer noticed and the cop arrested the gangster. Right? That doesn't work with the meaning the farmer noticed the gangster. So in that way, it, it really isn't a, you know, a, a counter example saying, suggesting that this is in fact a constituent. It's you gotta be careful about how you conduct that conjunction test. It's one that you have to conduct carefully or you might get a false positive. All right, the last one that we're gonna do is the farmer should be afraid. And we're testing should be. So again, I, I have a hard time finding a question that might work for this. The farmer what afraid? Should be. Nah, no. Um, how about an it cleft? It is should be that the farmer afraid. <laughs> that, well, no, that's awful. Um, we can do a conjunction test again. The farmer should be, but might, but might not be afraid. Okay, now that sounds good. But again, note the pauses. The farmer should be but might not be afraid. It couldn't be said, the farmer should be, but might not be afraid, right? It's gotta be, have the pauses, so it's not normal conjunction. So although it's a false positive, we can explain it away. So should be is not a constituent in that sentence. There's another way that we can demonstrate that though. We can show that should be can't be a constituent because be afraid is a constituent. So let's demonstrate that, that be afraid actually is a constituent. What should the farmer do? Be afraid. Um, it clefting doesn't work very well. It is be afraid that the farmer should. Um, but on the other hand, as we talked about before, verb phrases don't seem to be it cleftable. Um, how about movement? Be afraid the farmer should. Okay, that's not part of my dialect but uh, it does seem to be part of Yoda's dialect. And um, oddly enough, it, it, Yoda only fronts phrases, right? So he's still following the same sorts of principles that we've been looking at here. He can only move full phrase level categories. Be afraid, the farmer should. Um, then the last one, the farmer should hide under her covers and be afraid. So in this case, we took a verb phrase, hide under her covers, and conjoined it with be afraid, which tells us what be afraid is. It's a verb phrase. All right, so that does it for us for the tests. These tests are very useful, but you have to use them consciously and kind of have, a, have an idea of what we're aiming for. So we're trying to use a combination of tests every time. You don't wanna use just one test. You wanna use a combination of tests to see whether your hypothesis is correct.